Welcome to BCH Technologies. This is Kevin. Today we're going to talk about how to unclog dried Epson OEM inks. Many people keep using Epson's OEM ink because they believe that Epson OEM ink won't clog the printhead. Actually, dried pigment ink is the hardest type of ink to unclog, and sometimes using Epson will make things worse. Since we're talking about ink, let's see the difference between dye ink and pigment ink. Dye ink is designed to penetrate the paper and bind with the media underneath. Therefore, the dry ink dries similar to salt, and we can consider it as uh, uh, salt water. All the colorants in it is totally dissolved. So if a, a dye ink clogs, we can just add water and uh, dissolve it. Here's an example of dye ink. You can see the yellow can be see-through and it's totally transparent. And uh, so when you need a cleaning solution is for a tougher clogs of dye ink. The cleaning solution will have a dispersant and uh, will we'll just make the uh, process quicker and more thorough. On the contrary, the pigment, there are the particles suspended in the water, they are not dissolved. And, uh, and they lay on top of the paper. This is what gives the pigment a clear, laser sharp look. Uh, if you remember the dye ink, it penetrates, but in the process of penetrates, it also bleeds. So it, the penetration not only goes deeper and also the spread. But, uh, because the pigment only lay, uh, lays on top, their shape is more controlled, so that's why it looks sharper. However, because the ink layer lies on the surface, we need the pigment to bind to the paper as strongly as possible. Therefore, the pigment is more like cement. Once it's wet, it can move around, but once it's set, it's set for good. And here's an example of uh, the Epson 3640, and this is how many pages are printed before it's clogged. And uh, this printer only printed 400 pages be before it's clogged. And here's an example of the pigment ink. You can see the yellow is not transparent because the colorant is not dissolved, it's not salt water, and uh, it's just a small, really small particle suspended in this uh, liquid matrix. Dye ink look like a uh, color salt and uh, the pigment ink look like cheese. Okay, so that's that's the easiest way to distinguish the, the, the ink. So if we, um, I just use uh, this as an example. So if we just lay on top of it, get some particle laid on top of it, and uh, it'll be really easy to just blow away. So we need uh, something to bind those particles to the paper. The pigment particles are attracted by the physical force and designed to be as unbreakable as possible. So if we see a phrase that said anti-smudging in a pigment ink description, such as absence of dual bright ink, that means it will have a really strong bond to the paper. And unfortunately, it's very hard to remove after it's, it's bound to the surface. If we use an electron microscope to zoom in on the pigment particles, we'll find their strips are not round balls. Instead, the particles have holes within holes, which make the particle surface extremely large compared to its volume. These holes and the tiny volumes make the particles physically attract to each other or paper surface. Therefore, the pigment bond is a physical bond and not a chemical bond. Anyway, saying their cleaning solution can dissolve pigment is not telling the truth. The cleaning solution can make the cement wet and therefore weakening the bond between the pigment particles. Therefore, we normally soak the printhead in the cleaning solution first. However, we will need more physical activity afterwards, and the wetting process cannot solve the problem by itself. Epson has some building functions, 
which we'll discuss later. And uh, we'll also add some of uh, action ourselves. Now we need to talk about the C word, corrosion. Another way to dislodge the pigment rather than wetting it is uh, dislodge the pigment particles by corrosion. Corrosion is the, certainly not the best way to solve the problem, but it may be the only way. When I was a PhD candidate in ecology many years ago, after we tried all the fancy methods trying to solve the pollution problem, the last choice was always let's just dilute the pollution source. There's a saying, the solution to pollution is dilution. There are many people who use hustle. Uh, basically, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. There are many people who use household cleaners. Basically, those cleaners corrode the printhead and everything around the clock, so the clock can dislodge. It works, but may not be, be, be but may not be the best way to do it because it may damage the printhead. At the BCH, we do not use the household cleaners, and we will not recommend using them. We have two kinds of cleaning solutions. The green cleaning solution is only a wetting agent. It doesn't have any corrosive components, and it's absolutely safe for the printhead. We can leave the liquid inside the printhead for days without damaging it. We can use it when it's hot or at room temperature. We can also leave the bottle uncapped. A red cleaning solution has corrosive agents, but also have many counter-corrosive protective agents, as well as a group of surfactants. The process is like uh, just like you line up your stomach uh, liner with a Pepto, then you can drink alcohol. The process is what we call the controlled corrosion. When it is used properly, only the ink will be affected and the printhead will be safe. The protective agents will coat the printhead and prevent the printhead from damage. Once the surface of the clock breaks down, surfactants will carry debris away and let the solution work on a new surface. But this solution can only be used at room temperature, do not heat it up, and cannot be left inside the printhead more than 24 hours. We did not sell this to the public before. However, we think uh, we should give people a choice to, regarding the last chance to save a printer. In this episode, because we are dealing with a dried pigment, we'll use the red cleaning solution. Remember, keep at the room temperature and close the lid after use. Before we talk about clogging, let's get familiar with the anatomy of the Epson printhead. Absence printhead is always locked into a position. To unlock it, we need to use a printer's building function to pretend we are changing the cartridge. The lock is right here. The printer has a door switch on the top. If we put a piece of paper here, it will fold the printer think uh, the print's cover is closed. So we can illustrate the procedure easier. We will select a setup, maintenance, cartridge replacement, and ask for a replace cartridge and press the blue key. And it asks us to open the lid because we have this thing for the printer to think the lid is closed. So we just unleash this. And uh, now we cut the power off. So after cut the power off, now you can slide this easily. We'll put a piece of paper towel underneath so we can catch the waste ink. So what we do is uh, we fold the paper towel in half, then fold it into three, uh, a third and this will be perfect size to go underneath the printhead. We need to keep the printer unplugged because Epson may want to move the printhead. We don't want our hands get caught or damaging the printer's cable. Uh, Epson's uh, 
print as a sys right here. And uh, you can see the, the label, the Y label there. And then you have a cartridge set on the, sit on the top. And uh, here's the ink intake from, from the cartridge. And uh, if we take apart, the absence print ad is composed of uh, three layers. The top layer is the ink intake layer. The top plate has four ink intakes, one for each color. The top plate split each ink color into two, uh, into two injection tubes. Let's say this is a this is a, this is black, okay, and uh, the black gets split into two tubes, and uh, this is a cyan. And if you flip over, the cyan is split into two. The magenta is split into two, and the yellow gets split into two. Then the rubber layer is for sealing the top plate and the bottom plate. So it's just for the seal. So I know your question will be, oh, why does the top plate split each color into two? Uh, the inkjet squirt tiny ink drops on the paper to print. The ink is scored from a little tiny hole called a nozzle. To achieve a higher resolution, we we'll, of course we want the nozzle to be as dense as possible. However, there's a physical limit on how dense the nozzles can be placed together. So this is a uh, uh, physically impossible. So absence solution is okay, I'm going to split each color into two. And uh, so when the printer moves around like this, this has the same effect as this impossible. So if we take this printhead out, and we already talked about the top layer, and uh, we talk about the middle layer, the rubber layer. Okay, now we going to cover the bottom and this most important layer. So remember on your left is black, black, cyan, magenta, yellow. So black is actually this two. And then cyan, one here, one top, magenta, and the yellow. You get eight holes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And uh, when you print, when it prints, here's the here's the black nozzles. So you have uh, basically four columns. Two columns are black. Those two. Then on those two columns, you got the two cyan, two magenta, and two yellow. There are three things that mix up the print head. We have a series of delicate electronic components, the driver IC. If you flip it over, it looks like this. Okay, one problem is uh, if you squeeze too hard, if you have too much fluid pressure, the ink will leak from from this middle layer because they just put it together by the screw. So when it leaks, it will soak the IC board and uh, create a short circuit and uh, fry the printhead. So we have a uh, we can we have ink coming in here, and uh, then the second component here. If I if I blow it up. So first thing is on the top, we have a driver IC. The ink come down is going to a reservoir. And from the reservoir, it goes in. It's go to the ink channel. I know you cannot see inside and uh, the two-dimensional two diagram may not make sense, but so I made a 3D model. Okay, 
So when the inks come in, and uh, here's the channel, okay? So he, the ink flows in and it goes through this little tiny tube, okay? Here, and then come out, comes out. The second thing is called a, a thin film piezo, okay? So you have a thin, you have a really thin film here, and then there's a piece of material, which is a chip. So when you have electricity, this thing going to expand, as a, therefore it squeezes. So get a psh. and when it squeeze this tube, a little droplet comes out. And uh, the print app have a series of tubes of uh, ink channels. Okay, then it has all those little pieces and then they come out with a wire so we, they just like a play piano they squeeze each one and then there's tiny tiny hole which is the third thing called the nozzle the nozzle gonna squirt little ink droplet out so you have uh, three things again i see the uh, the chip the chipboard which cannot get wet and you get uh, TF, tfp thin thin film piezo okay which is this the, the thing up as a piano key and then you have a little tiny hole which is nozzle that's all the that's all it is for the printhead it may make sense to show the two-dimensional diagram here so you get a ink comes in from the ink reservoir and it goes through the ink channel you get a tfp which is the, like a piano key squeeze squeeze this and then it come out come out as a ink drop from the nozzle so here is the piezo actuators look like and uh, then here here's the different ink cavities and uh, here's if you look underneath you get those little tiny um, uh, tiny nozzles that's uh, 84.7 microns apart and then if you compare to over 3d model it comes in and going through and uh, then absence of play piano on this uh, so what do we learn from this so first thing is uh, the ink chamber has to be filled with ink if the chamber is filled with air, then the TFP won't be able to generate enough pressure to push the ink out. On the other hand, if the clock ink can be in the ink chamber, so you can have a clock here, somewhere here, to prevent ink going out. Also, if we damage some of the delicate TFP structure, because, because here it's just really thin film, the print head will permanently damaged. And uh, number four, uh, of course, we cannot get uh, the electronic unit wet. So we want to jump ahead and discuss direct flushing method for unclogging. The direct flushing uh, involves uh, putting a paper towel underneath the print head and then uh, And then you hook it up with a tube from the top. Then you're gonna inject a cleaning solution into the print head from the ink intake. Therefore, the clog will be pushed out, pushed out from the nozzle. This method is one of the most effective solutions and is widely used. And if we look at the above model of the ink reservoir and the ink channel, I will remind you one thing, the Pascal's principle. Okay, get your high school physics teacher on the line and uh, call her and uh, tell her actually her stuff is useful. Okay, uh, this is how we actually jack up a car. Okay, you get a jack, it's a, which, uh, which is smaller on one side, another one is on the top. Except now, we're using the large area to inject it back. So what's the problem here? So pushing too hard might cause a leak in the rubber layer. 
and therefore get an IC board wet. Once the IC board is wet, it's almost impossible to dry that out unless we open it up. Um, if the printhead is not dried properly, it might cause a short circuit right here and the permanently damage the printhead. If I fries the printhead, your mother-in-law will not be happy because you burn her printer. Uh, when she's not happy, you'll get this invited. Uh, when she's not happy, you'll get this invited from her family reunion. If we see an error 0x, six, uh, 0x92a after we flush the printhead, the motherboard is toasted. Uh, the second thing is you may also damage the thin film inside the printhead that we mentioned earlier. Therefore, the direct flashing is effective if the clock is minor, but it's not a good idea for harder clock. In the following sessions, we'll discuss how we do the direct flashing a little bit differently. Uh, the video game is getting long, so let's do a practical example first. So we're gonna do a die printer uh, in, in this uh, section. Um, this printer we pick up at the Craigslist for $30. The owner used purely Epson ink until it clogged. Uh, we threw in the storage for another three years. Uh, so the first thing we do is uh, clean up the printer and uh, switch it to dye ink. Okay, final check. All the refill holes are plugged. All the air hole, all the air holes are open. Okay, let's put the Epson cartridge to where it belongs. Trash can. Another check, nothing. Since we got a blank page for the nozzle check, we need to unclog all the colors. So we pretend to have a cartridge change, and then as soon as the, uh, the printhead moves, we un un unplug the power. And therefore, we can't move the cartridge freely within the printer. I will put a piece of uh, paper towel underneath the printhead to catch any overflows of uh, ink or uh, cleaning solution. All those tools and the cleaning solution can be found at uh, bchtechnologies.com and go to accessories. And uh, then you can click uh, anti-clogging agent. That's all the cleaning solutions. And also you can go to a uh, priming clip you can, you can find the flushing syringe and the titration tubes. The flushing syringe is just a syringe with a, with a piece of tubing. And the titration tube are two pieces of tubes, one is larger, one is smaller. We're gonna fill the syringe, the flushing syringe with about three to four mils of cleaning solutions. Okay, here it goes back to our model again. So let's say uh, we have some clocks here. And rather than we pushing the liquid and the clock through a really tiny hole, what we rather do is actually suck the clock back and suck it out of the tube. 
And then if we have any remaining clock, we want to fill this whole chamber with a cleaning solution. So the cleaning solution will break this part, at least make it soft, so it can get sucked out again. So we start with uh, pushing in a little bit, and then we draw the bad inks backwards to into the syringe. And then we pump a little bit again, and then we draw and pump and draw, pump and draw. Before you remove the syringe and discard the, uh, the dirty ink and solution, you still, the last action is you still want to push a little bit more cleaning solution into the pre-net. Now can, we can move to the next color. Your goal is get a little bit of cleaning solution into the pre-net and uh, remove the large clocks. So you, you, you won't be able to unclog the pre-net right away. Uh, so don't do it excessively. And uh, you don't have to do it again and again until the ink is clear. And the only thing you need to do is put a little bit of solution into the pre-net. Okay, now it's the hard work. Put a new pad on and then bring out the titration tubes. There are two pieces of tube, so you cut a you cut a uh, bigger tube, then you slide a little bit of uh, the smaller tube inside the large tube. Are confused? Okay, it looks like this. So you got a bigger tube, and then if you see the top of it, it got a piece of small tube, and they fit each other nicely. So the small tube is to fit the the ink intake, and the larger tube is for holding the ink. Now we're gonna fill each tube with a cleaning solution. Uh, there'll be air bubbles sandwiched between the, the cleaning solution and the pre-net. So we're gonna use a syringe and uh, use as a plunger, just a uh, Move on. We move up, up and down the plunger. Uh, you're gonna see the air bubbles coming up, and the, the cleaning solution goes in into the uh, the ink intake. We're gonna add a little bit more cleaning solutions, and also we use the needle as a plunger to remove the air bubbles. Uh, because it's dye ink, and also we use the red cleaning solution, which is super powerful. So the solution will cut through the dye clock, just like a knife in a butter. And, uh, so we're gonna, try, gonna just leave it for an hour and uh, see what happened. Okay, after an hour, and we can see a couple tubes are empty. That means it's unclogged. The, ink, uh, the solution have fall through the pre-net and onto our pad. Uh, that's a success. Okay, don't get too excited. We got a couple more colors to do. So we add uh, the cleaning solutions to those empty tubes, and then we bring out our uh, syringe plunger, just uh, keep removing the, uh, removing the air bubbles. Okay, here's about two hours later. You can see, uh, Previously, those three get drained out. So this one did still have the fluid, probably because there are some air bubbles here, and you can see the blue one is unclogged. So we just need uh, those two to work on. Oh, don't forget to changing the pad at each uh, iteration. 
Uh, just about 20 minutes later, you can see the uh, this is black. The black is unclogged. Now we only got uh, the yellow one. So we do the same thing. We move the plunger up and down. Just to give a good mix. And hope can unclog in another 20 minutes. Okay, uh, 20 minutes later, actually, uh, it's faster than I thought. It's unclocked. Uh, so it's time to suck out the remaining solutions and also remove the titration tubes. Just be careful when you remove the tubes. Um, make sure you remove both the large and the small tubes. Sometimes small tubes get stuck in the ink intake, so you probably need a plier and uh, remove the smaller tube. And after that, use a paper towel to dry the print net, and you are all set to go. You still have a cleaning solution inside the print head, so use the printer's building routine to clean your print head at least two or three times before you print the nozzle check. Okay, we did the two uh, cleanings and uh, it looked pretty good, except the light cyan. And here's your decision, you wanna do it again, or just like me, I don't, I don't use light cyan too much. And it's looking okay, so I'm gonna print the samples, see what the printout look like. So I can decide if I, if I can live with it. And also the, the clock this small, uh, it may, get taken care of by the remaining cleaning solutions. So lots of time, if you just set a printer overnight, the second day it will fix itself. So in the next part, we're going to discuss a little bit more about how to unclog the pigment ink printer. And uh, we're going to show you more ma method to unclog it. It's getting long, so if you're interested in your uh, pigment printer so go to next section okay have a good day bye thank you for watching visit us at bchtechnologies.com or locally in Greensboro, north carolina thank you cheers